that. Uh, we got going this morning and uh, really got charged up on some answers here. And I'm running a bit behind time. So today is going to be Q&A time. We will dedicate ourselves all the way to uh, just answering questions and uh, getting uh, some answers that I might be able to help you in the scripture. My name's Brad Zockel, and I do appreciate the fact that we can be together. And uh, so as we get rolling here this morning, I want to be able to encourage you. This is Open Line Friday, and we are going to get started. Good morning, Nicholas and Julia from UK. Good to see you, Linda and Vicki from Detroit. Good to see you. And traveling man, you're in Atlanta. Oh, great blessings upon you. Man, that is some traffic that I don't want to handle. Uh, thank you, Teresa, from, uh, for being here. From Ohio, Teresa is helping us out. Michigan, Lori, thank you so much. In California, we've got Miss Shannon here. Blessings back to you, Michelle. Appreciate that. Jeremiah, thank you for being here. Sky, I give you a hello back as well. And uh, Miss Evelyn, thank you so much for that uh, that encouragement. I really do appreciate that. And I found something out about those likes, which is a totally new thing to me. Well, what do you know? Naomi, thank you. And Skull from Indiana. Boy, there's a basketball state for you. Good to see you, Rue. Thank you so much for being here from Miami. I appreciate you being here. Marlene, let me see. There you are. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this... We have another horse lover, too, okay? And Miss Cammie uh, over from the Savannah area. Boy, she was from California in her youth and on a horse farm, a horse lover, uh, wonderful. And so you all get together. So uh, we've got another one from North Carolina as well. My goodness. Jay, good to see you. Zell, thank you so much for being here. And uh, let's take a look. Uh, Rick, thank you for being here. This is going to be Open Line Friday. We'll go right to the questions after some greetings here. We'll get going. Glendale, Arizona, Silver. I lived in Glendale over on Campo Bello uh, years back. I don't remember what the name of the, of, of the subdivision, but it was brand new. I was the fourth person in there when there was an explosive growth on there. I think it was off of Bell Avenue. Or Bell Road, I can't remember, but uh, then uh, we were down there, just down the road from the stadium, Arizona-wise, when you say just down the road, but oh, Glendale, wonderful area. Okay, so now Owasso's giving us an update. We were praying, uh, quote, my dad made it through heart surgeries, having complications. It's very delicate. Continue to pray for Owasa's dad. That was a very, very touch and go yesterday. We want to keep it in prayer. Becky, good morning. Sherry, good morning. Oklahoma City's checking in with Melissa. Good to see you in Connecticut. We've got Gordon here. Great to have you. And let me see. Uh, I'm on your TV, Isabella. I didn't know that that was possible. Well, wonderful. I, I, I'm totally thrilled. I didn't even know that that was possible. Well, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, I guess it is. Okay, uh, that, that makes sense now. Wow, that's a, that's a very humbling thing. I didn't know I was going to be on somebody's screen uh, in, in that sense. Okay, let me see. Zell, good morning. Nancy, good morning. Uh, I'm so thankful that you're here. Michelle, Daniel's giving a greeting to everybody, and so will we here. Uh, we, we appreciate it. West Virginia, Bobby is here. Um, and I, I want to ask you something. West Virginia, that, it's not the place that has a couple of mountains here and there, okay? I think I was going more uh, uh, vertical than I was going horizontal over there. It's a beautiful, beautiful area uh, over there. Been there a number of times. Has some friends over in Eleanor, St. Albans, uh, Beckley uh, area. Yeah, beautiful place. Okay. Let me see. We've got Deborah in California here. Tony is also here. Good to see you, Christina. Welcome. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, yeah, Christina, yeah, the, the, the traffic. Uh, Lois Vitara, Doug is also here. And we've got prayers going around. Shauna, thank you for being uh, in Arkansas. Great. Glad. Oh, I had no idea. Well, that's, uh, that's really something else on the TV. Ronnie from Colorado is also with us. And Brave from Philly. Uh, that's a uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful area. And boy, anybody, you get your history. You go on down there and see the bell, all right? Independence Hall and especially the bell there too. Oh my goodness, this is too funny. Mark from Dalton, Georgia. Our carpet man is here too. And so let me see. Doug, need prayer warriors? Uh, you are going, and we, there's some nerve problems. Doug has been dealing with the back problem for a while. Let's keep him in prayer. Continue. 
uh, here. Charles is here. Thank you so much. And Texas, we have Kimberly. Kimberly, I hope I see you on July 30th down in Dayton. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. All right. Um, thank you so much for the encouragement. All right. What we're going to do, friends, I'll give you a couple of announcements, and then we're going to go right to our time here. We're doing really good on time. Uh, once a week, and I usually like it to be Friday, we go to just having an open line Friday of questions and answers. And so we're going to go into that. Uh, a couple of things that I want to share with you here. I happened to pick this up and bring this up to the barn. And as you know, I was telling the TikTok group uh, uh, here and I'm not going to go into the story in detail, but yesterday I was working, and I heard a noise hit the roof, and then about 15 minutes later, I'm looking out through the double uh, doors of the barn here, and about a five-foot snake falls off the roof and hits the uh, the ramp coming up here, and I think it stunned it for a bit. Man, I grabbed a shovel out there, whomping on it, but it got away, and I just got the back of the tail and everything. So, I, so I've got a snake under here. Now, we've got to be careful around this area because... We do have cotton mouths, and so I have to be careful about where I reach, and I'm always wearing thick gloves and things like that. And I did find one at the very beginning of the year, but it was only about this long uh, and all. This one was just short of five feet. It was a big fella uh, and on here. So um, I've got a friend underneath the, the, the floorboards here, uh, somewhere underneath there. So I'm going to try to find a brave soul and pay them to go and clean out the rest of this. The former owners have a bunch of stuff under there. Now, I've cleaned out about half of it, but I can't get that far back. 64 and on, you know, crawling. And I'm not I'm not phobic about snakes. I'm really not. But I don't invite them, and I certainly don't go into their area and stick my face in, okay, uh, on there. So, uh, But something is always happening around here. It's so funny. Just when I was coming in here, I think there was a woodpecker trying to figure out how to get in here. Something was continually tapping, but... This is it. So we are very much in the rural area. Now, this is book number two. I brought this up here. And if you'd like to order this one, this one is the one that contains the blog about my former senior pastor who passed on into glory and in those final weeks was teaching us about heaven and as one who's saying, I'm walking toward eternity and it's going to be good. It revolutionized us, as I said. That's within here in the middle, okay? Now, in here, there is also a workbook section in the very back based on Scripture. We become Scripture obsessive in this ministry. And in the very front, you will see that it deals with questions that my friends here on YouTube and on TikTok have asked, and I put them to print. So if you're saying, well, I didn't really get a lot of notes on, on different things. It was going too fast. This is book number two. The aim is to have seven books, and we already have book number two and book number three I'm working on, which will be a more uh, uh, more detailed devotional uh, within there. I'm working on a, a different format on that. But this is book number two, and you can get this on Amazon. If you prefer a Kindle, Kindle's about half the price. I think it's only about $5 on there, and every purchase will help. As a matter of fact, the sale of uh, the books that we had in the first uh, uh, run, uh, our first two books, was enough for me to be able to travel up into uh, the Northeast and be able to uh, uh, take care of a lot of mechanical needs on my car. Very, very helpful. So thank you so much on that. All right, let's get right to it. Uh, we'll talk about other announcements here. We're going to take the whole time and go into the Q&A session here. So I'm going to do this. If you have a question, insert it in here, and I'll work my way right down through uh, the, the, uh, the, the different comments and look for questions or comments that need to be addressed, okay? So as we're going on down through here, um, let me see. And there's Miss Marlene and Jay. And okay. So Zell, uh, you'd like to start off with a challenge, not a question. And that's okay. We have a discussion here. The rapture is for only for the 144,000 virgin men, Revelation chapter 14. And so I would respectfully uh, be in issue with you. Uh, the rapture is for all. If you look at it, you're giving Revelation chapter 14 as a post description. Uh, the introductory, uh, the explanation of the rapture is clearly, clearly found, my friend, in 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 4. We which are alive and remain will be caught up to be with him. That would mean Paul is very clearly saying that he knows that he would be one if the rapture were to happen at that time. So, Zell, immediately we're running into a problem with your assumption here. Look at the scripture in its context. Look at it in its context. And that can take you to a couple of uh, uh, different books as well. In there, 
Paul very, very intricately describes what's going on. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So the bodies of those who have died ahead of time, such as my mom and my, my oldest brother and my dad, it clearly says those believers will rise first. Well, they wouldn't be. My mom's not one of the 144,000. Very clearly, those are 144,000 celibate Jewish men. It even names their tribes, 12 tribes of 12,000 apiece. It's very clear, though, so when you take a look at it, uh, what it's talking about. 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about the harpazo, which is the Greek word. Very clearly, the bodies of the dead will then join, as is continued to be explained in 1 Corinthians 15. Then in that fullness, that new creation, we will all be changed, verse 50 and 51. All of us, we will all, not 144,000, we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And as it continues on in verse 53 through 57, we will now have incorruptible bodies, immortal bodies were taken in. Jesus promises this in John chapter 14. I'm preparing a place, and when I finish this place, I'm coming for you. Not just for 12 tribes. I'm coming for you. A promise to it all. All right? Okay, let's continue on here. Let's see. And you're continuing, the B system seems to start next month. The word you say is seems, okay? And that's why I am so burdened to give you scripture in our presentations here. We have enough people. Just think of what happened during the course of this week when I talked about will there be pets in heaven. And I read yesterday an astounding number of people that said, yeah, but I believe, and it seems to me, and I want, and I've negotiated with God, and it was amazing, and not one not one gave a scripture on that. And I said, you must accept the fact that the Bible is silent. And for you to supersede this by saying, well, I'm telling you what, more than that, that is a very dangerous thing. And so that enhances it. When you're saying it seems to start, seems is a very dangerous word in my corner of uh, ministry here. I want to go with the scriptures and see what it says. How are we res recognized in heaven? A was very good point. How are we recognized in heaven before we have resurrected bodies? Well, let's just go to the scripture and let's take a look. Here's the fact. You're asking how, and I guess you would say this. Let me kind of bring it to this. Does the Bible say we will be recognized in heaven before we have resurrected bodies? And the answer is yes. Let me give you an idea. You'll find the references in Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke 9. Jesus, on the Mount of Transfiguration, brings down two current residents of heaven. Moses and Elijah. Moses had been dead for 1,400 years. Elijah had been dead for 900. And they're easily recognizable. Peter says, Moses and Elijah, which also tells you we will be given heavenly knowledge because Peter uh, never saw them on earth and there were no statues that was disallowed by the Jewish faith. Uh, there are no paintings and anything like that, lest you would uh, be in prohibition or, or you would be breaking, trespassing of the second commandment, making idols. And so they did not allow any leaders to have any uh, images made of them as well. So when you're saying how, you're asking me to step into the mind of God beyond the scripture, and I can't do that. But if you're asking will we recognize uh, in heaven before we have rested, oh yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 11 the writer of Hebrews gives you a list of Old Testament saints who are currently in heaven and names them. Noah, Adam, Rahab, Sarah, Abraham. Lists them. They had the righteousness to look forward to the Messiah to come, and they are in the comfort of God right now, in the presence of God, which will eventually take them to the point of having the resurrected bodies at the Harpon Zone. All right. Let me see. Let's continue down. And Kimberly, once again, thank you so much. I uh, I appreciate you being here, and I hope the scripture helps you helps you here. Okay, uh, Kirk, you're here. You got your coffee number two. Good. Alabama, Cheryl is here. Good to see you. And hello, Inspired is back. Good to see you. And uh, let me see. We have uh, uh, Skull is asking for prayers for two of the uncles in heaven. 
uh, in, in hospital right now. Please be in prayer for Skull's two uncles there in the situation, okay? All right, brave. I'm curious if I hold to the doctrine of eternal security. Let's say this. Let's 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 reword this very carefully. Does the Bible give you the uh, open explanation that once a believer makes a commitment to the Lord, the Lord makes a commitment to the believer of keeping them? And yes, it does. Yes, it does. Brave, I'm going to give you a gentle assignment to read the entire chapter of Romans chapter 8, and you will walk away with no doubt anymore. There is no condemnation, the first verse says. Uh, there is no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. And so the question is, what will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? This is only good for the believers in Jesus Christ, the followers of the Lord. And so then Paul asked rhetorically, can tribulation, can famine, can nakedness, can sword? Uh, I am persuaded that neither height nor depth nor angels nor principalities, which means demons, nor things present nor things to come, uh, nor uh, any other creation, and God is the only uncreated one, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I need you to understand this very carefully. If we could lose our salvation, then God is lying. All right? Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. He does not take them back. If someone were to say, well, yeah, he can, well, then this is a very strict statement you're making because Titus 1.2 says God cannot lie. Hebrews 6.18, it is impossible for God to lie. And so we have something here which is very clearly laid out in the Bible to give us all comfort. Okay. Isabella says, copperhead snakes emit a cucumber smell, so if you smell that outside, be aware uh, Isabella, I will tell you very freely, if I am anywhere even near a copperhead that I could smell the cucumber, I am going to be uh, very, very surprised. Uh, I keep a distance. Uh, I have about three rakes here when I will do any kind of weeding. And when I do the uh, uh, lawn mowing over here, um, then I'm always very, very careful ahead of time. But I will promise you, if I hear, I do love cucumbers, but if I get a cucumber smell inside, you'll be the first to know that I will make tracks in the other direction. Um, Brenda could be a black rat snake. I'm going to find out because I know earlier there was a snake up the hill here. Um, I'll turn this around and let you look <clears throat> out through the door. We're still constructing. You'll see we're working on the ceiling here today. Up through there, when I was going up that hill, that's where I usually will have the morning devotional time. Uh, just today, uh, I, I didn't do that. I wanted to be in here and have everything around me. Uh, but there was a fairly good uh, black snake up there, and I left him go because I do like the idea that rodents are kept at bay here. This one I don't know uh, on there, but uh, I'm not going to go underneath and try to identify him. No markings, though, like a, a rattler or anything like that, thankful, thankfully. All right, and we have our referee, uh, Dan Crane, is here holding us all together here. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay. Um, uh, Nancy, I do not attend a church. I serve my Lord from home through prayers, reading the Bible, sermon, and teaching from the Bible. Well, Nancy, then you must look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 and justify your decision. If you are physically unable to, that's between you and the Lord. But the Bible is very clear. You're not to forsake the, the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, knowing that the time is short. The encouragement. See, think about this. Uh, not only do, do I need encouragement from others, and at 64, I yes, I do have uh, three spiritual mentors that I even the other day, I met with two of them under complete submission and giving them our ministry needs and things like that and asking advice. Okay, but then I go to church and one of them we attend, we go between about three churches here and one down the road that I go to, I love absolutely. The encouragement is so important and they just embraced our family, a little church of about less than 100 and they have taken us in and also then we find out as well, you can be an encouragement to others when you attend there. I can't begin to tell you that when my dad abandoned the family and my mom took us to church and says, oh, we're going to be there. How many as a kindergartner, as a first grade, second grade, third grade, junior higher, 
and such. I looked up to the leaders of the faith within there and saw how they were on a Wednesday night, on a Saturday uh, yard work for the church, on during the course of the week, or they visited at Christmas time to say hi, or we exchanged in all of these gatherings and everything, and how I admired them so deeply, and I found that. And so you very well may be an example that somebody needs, and so there's a lot of uh, encouragement there. But I'm going to tell you, if you're asking me right now, is that fine? If you're physically able to be at a church and you're not attending, no, it's not fine at all. I'm just going to be very clear with you, no. Uh, if you are physically able to. And let me tell you something. When somebody says, what's well, inconvenient? This little church I'm talking about down here, do you know people are going to be an encouragement and to be encouraged and to hear the straight out scriptural teaching? There are some that are very infirm who will go in their car and the church has actually made a, a, a little broadcast system so they can be in the parking lot in a smaller group, but they will be there and people will come over to their car and encourage and such like that. And I see those who even under physical pain say, it is so important for me to be together with others. They will go through that discomfort. So I want to encourage everybody here. I take a, 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 I, I just a, a, am ready to go to the scripture and uh, a, a take a battle with anybody that says, well, I'm okay, I don't need, or heaven forbid they go, this is all I need on this channel. I am not your pastor. If you were sick, I can't come and visit you. Okay, I can't do counseling to other people. As a matter of fact, the minute I leave here, I have obligations in ministry and other places. I am not a shepherd. Okay, there's a very clear point in the three T's in Titus and First and Second Timothy, and you'll see that. And we need to be under those. As a matter of fact, it's so exacting. Acts chapter seven says, as they were ministering in the beginning of the church in Acts, that they needed to have helpers under the leaders to be able to, quote, wait on tables, which not only means ministering foodstuffs, but also distributing financial needs. It had a, had a wide term. So, so we want to be very, very careful about that. If you were baptized when you were a kid, Bobby asked, do you need to get baptized when you're older? Question, Bobby, why? You want to ask yourself, why do you uh, want to get baptized? This is not some pedantic ritual if you have come and you said, for example, when I went to Israel, uh, about seven people each time on the bus, uh, the two tours that I took, came over and said, Brad, we know that you're ordained. Would you baptize us in the Jordan River? And I said, is there a decision you're making? They said, well, I really feel that I've been here. We've, I've really un undergone a, a need for rededicating my life and just enhancing and making a public statement of it while we're in the Jordan, this very historical and wonderful place. Oh, absolutely, I'll, I'll be glad to do that. And they gave their testimony, and there were even people that we didn't even know who were standing around and listening as well. People from other countries were listening uh, uh, on there, and that's wonderful. There's no prohibition for that. But the question is, Bobby, why? Are you just saying, well, it's some sort of a ritual I need to do so people don't get on my case or anything? Baptism does not give you salvation, but baptism is a joyous display of your identification with Christ. And if you feel that this would be a wonderful visual display of my continuing and growing love in the Lord, absolutely, go do it. Wonderful. Nicholas, will we be able to talk to Jesus one-on-one -on -one in heaven? Well, what we see, Nicholas, in the Bible, it leads us to say, yes, we will see God face-to-face, -face, Revelation 22, 4. God being Jesus, being part of the triune uh, personhood, the, the, the God in the Trinity, we see the Holy Spirit will be in heaven, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. We see that Jesus is there, Revelation chapter 1. It's a whole list of verses there, the description of him. God the Father is there, uh, Revelation chapter 6. And so they are as one entity, the three and one. So when we see God, we see Jesus. Will we see him face to face? Yes, we will. Uh, in there, will we be able to? And it gives you the, uh, Jesus even says this in Matthew chapter 5. We will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And the word in the Greek is opsontai, which means a continual seeing of him. What we see in the scripture is, yes, you will be able to be with the Lord. As close as I can tell you from what I read in the narrative, yes, you will be there. He loves the individual, emphasized by Revelation 21.4 and Revelation 7.17. God will wipe away every tear. The emphasis is upon the individual tear, which talks about a personal touch. All right. Good morning, Kelly. 
Thank you, Dan, for putting those, uh, and also I know Teresa does this too, putting down the references. Kelly, can you please explain the difference between your spirit and your soul? There are different Bible scholars that will give a presentation, and there's nothing doctrinally shaking if somebody says it. Some groups, I'm going to give you some fancy words, which I don't like to do uh, on here much, but I'm going to do it anyway on here. Uh, there are those that they call, they are called dichotomists, and they believe that the Bible tells you you just have two parts to you, your body and your soul, and other are trichotomists, and they say you have a body, soul, and spirit. Well, let's just go to the three in that case because you say, well, I see it in there. All right, the Greek word for soul is suke. This is the entity of morality. This is the uh, decision-making. This is what we would say in Deuteronomy 139, the knowledge between good and evil. And in that, as explained both in the Hebrew and, of course, this is a Greek word in there, is this, uh, as the Greeks would say, this is you. This is your personality. This is your talent. This is your method of speech, your ability to learn, uh, your moral decisions, and things along that line. That's the suke. And that's the one that keeps emphasizing that we'll be in heaven. The spirit is panuma. And yes, you do pronounce the pi, panuma. And that is talking about uh, the, uh, the life spirit, the spirit of animation, which keeps you moving about, the, the energy of life in there, the dichotomist would say. If you are one who says, I believe that everybody has a body and a soul and a spirit, that would be the delineation. If somebody else says, well, you know, that's just talking about the, the, the breath of life because pneuma also means literally breath or wind uh, on there. And then we hold it to that. And so uh, you're saying, Brad, are you a dichotomist or trichotomist? And the answer is yes. Look, I'm good either way. I really am. It does not, it's not earth shaking. I would never have a problem when somebody says, well, no, I hold it. This is fine. Absolutely fine. Okay. May I say this uh, doctrinally? We have bigger fish to fry. And, and I'm not even saying there's any, any conflict with it, but uh, that would be, that would pretty much be the, 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 that difference there. All right. Okay, MJ, according to JWs, the 144,000 of those who accept the governing Jehovah's kingdom because I did attend their memorial service in Staley, everything. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they believe. However, if we're going to the scripture, we have a big conflict there because uh, the governing, and we see nothing in there, Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, it's embarrassingly obvious that they are missionaries to the earth during the wrath, the flipsis, the time of the Great Tribulation, and then the results are found in the celebration on Mount Zion, as you see in Revelation chapter 14. To take this and say and start adding storying to it is, is very biblically irresponsible. Um, let me see. Johnny said, I'm wondering how they watch and learn from us because they're learning the mystery of the gospel from the church. Uh, by example, by example, let me give you a personal idea, all right? We were kindergarten, first grade, and they would have a time when they would play. I'm telling you how small this could be. You're talking about Matthew 10, 42, just giving a cup of water, cold water to the younger Christians and you will receive a reward. We were in the service and we were kindergarten, first grade, and uh, and I'll sit with my mom obediently and everything, and they would have a singing, as, as some do. And the little church down the road, the little country church I attend right now, they do this as well. They, they take a break during one of the stanzas, and they say, turn around and shake hands with everybody, okay? So we would at this church in Hershey, outside of Hershey, in a little town called Sand Beach. And uh, we would go around. Now, there was a little old man, and he had to be 90 if he was a day nicest little man, bald as an egg, and he would sit there because he really couldn't sing that much. He would tap, he would roll up his bulletin and tap to the music as a happy man. When we came around, he had a pocket full of little sticks of gum. 1960s, that's big stuff. He would hand one out. I'm telling you, just the giving spirit among all of us, and the kids would go over and they're shaking hands on it. Nobody ran to him, Gibby, right? But they would go over there and start going up and down shaking hands. It was a spirit of welcomeness and of joy. And the pastor's like, gum's okay if it comes from this gentleman. I don't even know the man's name. But I learned the spirit of giving at the age of kindergarten, first grade, from this tiny little man sitting three rows from the back who handed out gum to children. Do you get it, Johnny? Even in little things. Or for me, I can't tell you how impressed I was for me, a second grader, 
to receive the grip of a, of a six foot tall man, a handshake, treating me as if I was an equal in Christ. I cannot begin to tell you the emphasis and the joy or when you got in line at a picnic over at our tiny little church and somebody would say, let's let this young man in. Let's let you know his, his brothers and sisters in. They would put us in front. And we saw the giving spirit in those ways among many others. It's like, okay, I see Pastor McClure up front giving a message, but does this work? I'm thinking in my third grade mind, my first grade mind, does this work among people? Did they live this? And we did, even in playing softball at a church picnic or somebody's over there and they're in a skit or they're in, we're in a volleyball game with a beach ball and people laughing and enjoying and not shoving people like I see in other parts of life and lying and things like that. And the example around me was like walking through a textbook. That's what I'm talking about. And we have John from Mesa. Good to see you, John. Thank you, Dan, for putting this down. Okay, MJ, from a news reporter, I remember the weight of a human body changes by a tiny amount like the weight of a stack of nickels or something. So I believe that confirms every human has a soul. I've also heard that. There is a story going around that there was one um, a ancient physician that would see people in the days when they did have people on their deathbed and when they breathed their last and then they weighed different. I have no idea whether there's any truth to that. It doesn't shake my faith or confirm my faith anymore, but I, I am familiar with that. And so uh, that would be a secular affirmation of the soul. It could very well be. Okay, Isabella, can your name be blotted out of the book of life or is it in there forever? Well, in, in a sense, before we have the knowledge of good and evil, our name is in the book of life, as you see. Revelation chapter 2 bothers some people when it says there, but you follow it in context, okay? So when we first have our knowledge of sin, that takes us out of the book of life because now we're in rebellion against the Lord. But then when we come to Christ, our name is written in the book. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 15. In the book keeps us from condemnation, all right? Verse 15, if our name is in the book of life, we do not have condemnation, all right? So, Revelation 2, and somebody says, yeah, but it says that I will not block your name out of the book of life. What's just telling you, okay? You are to live for the Lord, and you won't have that. You know, you come to him, and you will not have that danger. That's what it's saying. It's kind of like this. They have a rule in town here. It says, you murder somebody, you're going to go to jail for a very long time, everything. Well, what's that all about? Like the danger of lifetime incarceration? Well, the warnings there, just don't murder people. You know, and the different warnings there, uh, that would happen. So is anybody on here right now that has faced that danger? Well, I hope not, you know, but the majority of the people here have not been going around taking innocent lives, okay? So what it's talking about there in Revelation chapter two is that fact, in Christ, you will not have your name blotted out. Bridges family, there's a prayer, Melissa. Uh, we had uh, the uh, a little one passed away yesterday. Friends, put this down for the Bridges family in this time of mourning. Uh, we want to do, and, and please, Melissa, let us know if there's anything we can do as a family here. We will, of course, take this to the Lord in protection of prayer for them. And I'm gonna ask everybody, if you might remember this, pray this specifically for this dear family. Philippians 4, 7. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, that they might have the peace of God, which even extends past understanding. It, the One translation says that passes understanding. Another translation says that they might receive the peace of God, which goes beyond explanation. We want to do that right now for the dear Bridges family. Remember that. All right. All right. Um, Silver, I was taking care of my mother-in-law the night before she passed away. She kept reaching for the sky. She was so weak. It was amazing to me. Is there a scripture? Could she be reaching to someone? Well, I would say this, as I saw with our pastor in the story came back. When he was in his last 24 hours, he kept telling the nurses, the attending believers, the, 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 the nurses were all Christians, and he kept signaling over that cancer had reached his throat so he could only whisper. And he says, I see them there. And I said, who, Tom, who? And he says, there's angels above us. What are they doing, Tom? Describe them. And he gave them a description. I have it in the, one of the books. 
uh, on there. And I want you to read that. That's in book two of this whole story. And I'm going to give it to you very quickly. He says, the angels, well, what are they doing? Well, it seems like they're waiting. They're waiting. They're just hovering in expectancy. Well, then we go to Luke chapter 16, and we see when Lazarus, the believer, died, angels took him up. Could it be in the uh, passage, as you were asking then, Silver, I would say if you're asking for scripture, Luke 16, angels bore Lazarus up to heaven, and my uh, following of Luke 16 would tell me that Tom Craig was also taken by angels. It also enhances the fact that we're never alone. We're embraced even in the steps of death all the way to heaven. Oh, we're doing fine. We still have 20 minutes. Uh, Doug, the, with the back surgery, I'll not be able to attend my church. And here's the thing. See, I want you, I want you to understand this. Now, look, here's Doug, which we've known since almost the, the week that he has joined us. He has gone through multiple uh, 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 different procedures for his back. And here's somebody saying, even with the strength, and look, I've had back injuries. And the Zockel family has a history of bad backs. And I have been, and so I, I can attest to the fact of what he's going through. When you have a bad back, an injured back, it affects everything on you, all right? And here he's saying he's going to attend his church. May we take, for those of you who are full body, and says, well, I don't want to go to church. Then, then may you look with embarrassment upon somebody who is so dedicated, even with that, he's going to go anyway. I remember speaking in Tocoa, Georgia, years back when I was single. And there was a lazy boy recliner over on the side of this church down there in the Tocoa area, the church I was speaking in. And I said, well, now that's curious. So what's that? And they said, we have a lady who has a severe skin condition along with back problems. And she has just drug her. And she, they said, it'll take a good five minutes for her to make the length that she will move on her walker in deep pain, but she will be here. The church got together and bought her that recliner because she actually could not sit in wooden pews. Think of it, you know, a little Southern church uh, uh, down there. They gave her a recliner and every week, and they said, uh, we need you to know, Brad, she is in pain, but she will not miss any service. She will be here Sunday morning, Sunday night, anytime that there is a message to be given, she'll be here. And I always thought, dear Lord, may I always see that as an encouragement. She underwent physical pain to receive spiritual strength too. May we always remember that. Okay. Um, inspired. I haven't looked for a new church since we moved two years ago. The one I went to before I moved was only a few times. I stopped going because all I did while inside the church was cry. Inspired. We all worked through that. I can tell you after I lost the loved ones, I was sobbing at our church and people would go around and one of the spiritual mentors came over and just comforted me and it, and it was hard, deeply hard. But the one thing that I needed very desperately was the comfort of others around me and then the careful instruction from the pulpit. And I'm gonna remind you, my senior pastor from Tennessee was a quadriplegic who not only comes to church all the time, he leads us, what an inspiration for somebody who has no use of all four limbs and still is able to minister to us too. And it is so, so very important that we're in that in, in with an assembly of believers. Okay. Uh, I would say this then inspired when you're saying this crying, the one thing I found out, the great joy of the assembly is when I went to a Bible-believing, God-loving, Jesus-promoting church, it didn't matter how I presented myself or in what way. And even in my incredible cry at the drop of a hat, people would sit and they would show me respect uh, if I needed some quiet time or sit with me when I needed somebody else. My wife and I needed help uh, in encouragement and would take over. When my wife, Epstein's Bar and Fibromyalgia, we're driving her down physically, and she would just barely, I would be holding her, crawling across the auditorium in severe pain. People would come around and embrace and pray and care. I'm telling you, I don't even know in our worst times how we could stay away from a church. So may I tell you, if you go to a church where you feel like you're being looked at on anything but love, find another church. Find another church, all right? 
If they don't understand how to take care of you, oh, I've been to churches like that. I've been to churches where I went in the middle of a, of a, a church one time, visiting a church, and a homeless man walked in the back. And believe it or not, to my and I wrote this in one of my books. I believe it was in the Gas Tank Chronicles, and I had to write this down because I was beyond stunned that I was sitting there in the back. It was a cold November night, and I was single, traveling through the area. I tucked myself into a church. It was probably about eight hundred people. And I got in here, and it was a husband and a wife, probably in their 60s, probably my age now, uh, maybe a little bit older, uh, sitting on to my right uh, front diagonally, and a homeless man sat over here. And during this time, the, the wife kept doing something, which caught my attention even though I was trying to listen. She kept dodging her head like this, and she kept putting her hand to her nose. And so when they stood up, she it became apparent. She was saying that this homeless man stunk, and her husband was between her and the man. So he did. I did not smell anything, but she would persist in this. Are you ready for this? I am telling you before the Lord what happened. She handed him a bottle of perfume. And when they were all looking forward in prayer, he was taking the perfume and throwing it, this little vial, slinging it in the direction of the man. It was sprinkling him. And I'm seeing this. Now, I'll fully admit, I was totally thrown by this. And I had my eyes open during a prayer. I was beyond stunned. I have never seen anything so callous. And the homeless man looks up and looks over because he knows he's getting wet. He's trying to figure out. And this man would act like he didn't do anything. When he put his head back down, he'd sling it on him too. I was beyond mortified. And I was in decision as the thing, either to go to my right and to chastise these people in a Matthew 18 principle on why in the world you would do something so hurtful or else to go to this man who obviously knew he was being rejected and talking with him. I decided to go to my left to the man and go and, 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 and get to him. And when I met him out in the lobby, I just said, I am so sorry for what's happened. And, uh, and I didn't go like, I'm not a member here and everything. I said, you are loved and welcomed by the Lord. And he started stammering. It's cold outside. I, 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 I came inside. So mentally he was having some problems and I tried to get someone that was in, of the church service to help him on the staff. I couldn't find anybody. And when I turned, he was gone. And to this day, I grieve, and I tell you, even right now, I try to keep my emotions in check because this man went out feeling unloved. That was the last time I set foot in that church. I was, and I wrote the past, I did, uh, there. We came to visit one time over out west. I'm not going to say even the town. And if I named the church, some people would recognize it. And when we sat down in an auditorium early, a family came over, and my, uh, my second oldest boy was in middle school. And a man came over and then trumpeted to his wife in our view and says, Martha, I can't sit here. This boy's got my seat. This auditorium held over 3,000 people. But we were sitting in the exact place. I was stunned. This boy never looked at us. We were visitors. And I openly said to him, we are visitors here. It didn't matter. This boy sitting in our seat would totally ignored me. Same thing. Found church. And, and, and of course, I uh, talked with the pastor about this as well. Find a church. But then we found loving churches that embraced us visited in our time of need, helped us and such. Okay, Becky, I'm looking for a church. What questions do I need to ask to find a proper biblically based home? The first thing, the first thing is go to the website, look under the statement of faith, see whether they're biblical. You can get a lot of questions answered. Go to their website, go to the statement of faith and find out what they believe. All right, that's the, that's the main thing. The main thing, everything else is so secondary. Then when you go later on, find out how they, uh, what, what their programs are. Are they teaching? Are they taking care of the kids? I would go around. We went to a church which was very well and their nursery was a disaster, was a shambles. And we had a, a car seat uh, sized baby at the time. I couldn't go back because I worried about the safety of my child and such. And so there were practical things. But the very first thing is go to the Statement of Faith on their website. Daniel, the question, does the mark of the beast come after the rapture? I was thinking you answered, but before I can't remember. Yeah, yes, absolutely. We are taken from here, Revelation 3.10. The believers will be taken before the trial, which comes upon the hour of trial, comes upon the whole world. Revelation 13 introduces the, uh, which would be in the thick of the, the, of, of the time, of the uh, tribulation, the thlipsis, Revelation 13. And the conclusion of Revelation 13 says, now there's a call for loyalty. Just as Revelation 14, the missionaries were sealed with the seal of God for protection, 
those in their call of loyalty will be sealed by the Antichrist, the false Messiah, in a call of loyalty, which will condemn their souls. Okay. Okay. Uh, Zell, I think that you just need to go. I know you're going to try to do uh, a, a word play on 7 and 14, and I'm just sorry, with all respect, uh, I'm just telling you, you're not following the scripture. You're not looking at 1 Thessalonians 14, uh, 4. You're not looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You're totally ignoring them to find something. And what you're in danger of, my dear friend, of, is of cherry picking. You are what's in danger of the colleges. It's called eisegesis. You have an agenda, so you're going to make scripture move to that area. And that's a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, on there. You're, you're going into a timeline, which Jesus specifically says in Matthew 24 and 25, no man knows of this time, and uh, lest you start pinning, saying, well, it's just an hour or the day. You and I first know, uh, clearly know, he's speaking in a hyperbolic fashion. No one can make this prediction. So, Zell, I'm going to plead to you, if you are a believer, to be very biblically honest and look at this in the say. See, you're using the term again. You said seems, now you're saying, well, it looks like and all of this kind of thing. And it's a very dangerous thing because you and I know that there are many people on TikTok. This one girl came on here and said, oh, May 22nd, it's happening. Well, now what's happened to her? It's a false prophet, Deuteronomy 18. No credence whatsoever anymore because you're not accurate. So when we start going about, you're not going to find us on this channel. We let the scripture speak for the scripture. And I'm not going to grasp, such as I believe you would do, uh, Ecclesiastes 9.5 and make it into a whole doctrine, taking it out of context, which is what you're doing with 7 and 14. I give you every respect. But if you want to get very clear and put this on the table, you are highly bending these two chapters to meet your personal needs, and that is something that I cannot leave unaddressed. Okay. All right, inspired. God bless you. Look at you. And, and that is a wonderful thing. You are getting serious about this. Get to a good Bible-believing church. And, and through the years, my wife and I have been to churches that exceeded 2,000 in membership. Uh, and we've been to one that it couldn't hit 50. All right? The numbers mean nothing. But we were in an organized, responsible uh, a, a God-loving, Bible-intensive church that cared about family, and, and it's so, so very important. Nice work. Okay. Michelle, get to it and keep us informed of, of that, all right? Very much. And Jenny, yeah, it still boils my blood, and this is 40 years later. For people that could be so cruel, and have I been, I worked in rescue missions, some of the people that we've worked with, and you have to, don't anybody think I'm trying to give you a personal example, and, but I've worked in, in, in uh, ministered, ministered, I, I wasn't employed by pay, ministered in minimum security prisons, medium security prisons, uh, ministered there, uh, had visited a maximum security prison uh, twice, uh, worked in rescue missions, uh, worked in homeless shelters, uh, and, things. and some of the smell is unbelievable. People that were coming up that had vomit sprayed upon them, their own vomit and things like that. And look, you know, uh, even as you hear, I have a, a, a birth defect from breathing, but still smells are very, very, uh, uh, very powerful to me. But I'm thinking, look, that, that could be me. That could be me, you know? And, uh, you know, and I come to a church and somebody's slinging perfume on me. Oh, it, my, my heart still hurts for that. Okay. Yes, and traveling man, you cried uncontrollably in church, especially with hymns. I thought the Holy Spirit was truly there. Absolutely. When Tom died, I was a wreck whenever we would sing. Uh, I can't even tell you the song because I'm going to lose it right now. But uh, there was a song that he asked in his dying days for them to repeat over. And look, for a year and a half, I could not hold myself together on it because it brought back so much. And yet, through that... I was able to reach people who are also grieving, and even now. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. We have six more minutes. Yes, um, on it, Sherry. I, it would be so wonderful, as Paul intimates in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 90, to see that homeless man in heaven and saying, despite that, I found Christ. Um, oh, here we go. Here's one of our trucker friends from Connecticut. Great morning. Thank you. So much for being here. 
Dan, you are correct. And then we also watch for not only the teaching of the of their do they follow the teaching. All right. You can have things written down and people will move away from that. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, see, now, and now here's something else with and, and Tony, and I understand his situation. And Tony is so faithful, and he's even been with us on Zooms and things like that. And Tony, I know his heart full well, this gentleman. He wants to be there. And may it also convict those of us who are able-bodied, who say, I don't feel like going there. You know how Tony feels? He desperately wants to be with his family as well at the church. Isabella, how do I feel? Well, it's irrelevant about how I feel, but I'm going to continue on with the question. Dedicating kids to God when they are young instead of baby baptism so they can make the decision to be baptized on their own when they're older and understand their decision um, on that. What does the Bible say about dedicating? It talks so much in Ephesians uh, 6, for example, of the parents and the children being a family unit of dedication. If a church follows this and says, then we're giving it to the Lord. We dedicated, my uh, wife and I dedicated, uh, had a time of dedication before the church on all three of our children. Yes, we did. And the Bible is, does not prohibit that. Uh, it gives you just a wonderful encouragement on the family unit in dedicating to, and that absolutely is an important thing. Okay. Amy says, my father was a pastor. I grew up doing tasks in the church during the week that I enjoyed doing. And he'd say, God will give me a jewel for that. Why? I just enjoy doing these things. And it's it's true. We can enjoy those things. I'll give you an idea. I um, uh, had uh, tutored a, a child uh, in England back when the internet was new for, for years because there was a communication need. And at the very end, uh, I was just enjoyed to be able to have an international student. And the family said, Brad, we want you and your family to come over here. We're paying for a flight over here uh, for you to come and be with us after two years. And I was just stunned. I said, well, but I didn't ask for pay. And they said, we, we, they're Christian people. And it was just, I did this for the joy of seeing this young man learning communication skills and honoring and Christian family too. Uh, and the boy was as well. And then when we got over there and sat at their place over in England, in the countryside, wonderful, wonderful place, uh, there, and then they slid a, an envelope across the table packed with British pounds, and they said, this is two years' worth of salary. I said, but I didn't do this for this year. I mean, they said, this is our joy, and they took us into London. Oh, we had a wonderful time. I didn't do that, and yet there was the joy of receiving something, and Amy, that's the same way. We know your heart, and then the Lord says, oh, I have something to give you anyway. All right. Uh, thank you for all the encouragement here. Okay, Isabella, and I'll finish with this one. Can you leave us a verse to keep in mind today? I absolutely will. I want you all to bear this in mind and commit this to memory. A very exciting verse. When we talk about the promises of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Which basically says this, the promise and the encouragement of the believer is, you have no idea how God is going to bless you in heaven. You have really no idea of the magnitude of the joy that the Lord is going to give us in heaven. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. If I'm going to encourage you, and, and uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful uh, encouragement, Isabella, for us to do this. Yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. I want to thank all of you, my dear friends. Thank you. If you're seeing this later on and you're not watching this live and you're seeing this here, uh, please rewind. Hold me accountable for these scriptures that I've given you. I want you to become students of the word, very much so, especially in the study of heaven. Thank you so much, moderators. You've been wonderful. I appreciate this. And uh, we, we get into the scripture and take a look at the depth of the scripture and let the Bible speak. And that's how we find the joy and the, uh, not by man's uh, calculations or by his design or opinion. We find it by the eternal word of God. As we, we said in, Revel in Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, let God be true, every man a liar, okay? His word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Thank you so much. God bless you. I hope uh, later on, uh, you will find I will be doing some posting later on this evening, putting it on. If 
it is possible. I'm going to aim for this. I will try to be on tonight. I'm going to try. Uh, my wife and my daughter are down at her college. They're getting things ready. And so I'm batching it tonight and I am going to bring everything down to the farmhouse. And if things go okay, I will try to come on about eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. If you come on for about five minutes and I'm not on, it's because maybe an obligation happened. But I will aim for that this evening here on YouTube. I'll go YouTube. Last time I went on TikTok, I'll go here on YouTube, okay? All right, you all take care. God bless you. This is Brad Zocco here in Upcountry, South Carolina. I've got a couple of barn cats I gotta go feed and then also maybe just make friends with the snake uh, and everything and then moving on. Thank you so much. God bless you and Lord willing, we'll talk soon.